on July 5th, 2013, batch number four of puppies arrived at Bushwinkle Kennels. The parents are Kama and Dunai, both of Bushwinkle Kennels. There are eight males and three females in this batch. In August, we braved the busy tourist season and headed to Europe to visit our friends and the six-week-old pups. We flew into Berlin and by good fortune we arrived early. We took a cab to our hotel and we were able to eat breakfast there at their eighth floor buffet. The hotel is close to the old radio tower and also the convention center so we could see them from the buffet room. We rested in the hotel and then took a walk in the afternoon. We went to a bakery that Joyce knew about nearby and had a snack there. While we were snacking, a storm blew up, so we were pretty wet by the time we got back to the hotel. However, we looked out the window and saw a beautiful rainbow that was covering the city. Later in the evening, we went to the adjacent bus terminal, got on a long-distance bus, and went to Poland. We found all well at Bushwinkle. The pups still like to catch a snack from their mother, but they also know about their food dishes. But it's a girl. Two stupid dogs. <laughs> stupid girls. We spent time distributing treats and gifts to everyone. Tedus is one of our Aracana chicken brothers, but unfortunately he has all but lost his flock. I had gathered up, actually I had bummed eggs from a number of friends in America, transported them to Poland in carry-on luggage. Tedus had borrowed a nice incubator, so we put our eggs in the incubator, hoping that they would hatch. Beta served a interesting traditional Polish meal of sour barley soup. My old friend Jeremiah Johnson is there. He spends a lot of time inside. When Mr. Johnson is outside, though, he's quite the hunter and brings in a lot of rodent treats and even shares them with the other pets. Billy the Kid is the outside kitty. He's a real nice kitty, comes to eat on the windowsill in the kitchen, but he also likes to be outside. He is kind of a clown and he has a particular pole that he enjoys out there. The weather in Poland was absolutely beautiful and clear. We spent much of our time outside. One day I walked around the corner of the house to find Fritz asleep in the yard under a tree. I woke him after two hours. Because of the short growing season in Poland, our friends have a garden and a small greenhouse. One of their crops is tomatoes and there are a great many of them, one of which I believe had been fertilized with steroids. One day, Betta and I went out and harvested a large crop of cucumbers, as well as some dill. 
she put us to work in the kitchen then making dill pickles and still had a great number of pickles left over and asked us what would we do with them. We suggested bread and butter pickles which was something she had never heard about. We looked on the internet, found a bread and butter pickle recipe and made six jars of beautiful bread and butter pickles. The only problem was the recipe called for celery seed and they don't know about that in Poland. We've put that on the shopping list to take to Beta for our next visit. One day, a pup decided that Fritz's pant leg made a very good toy to wrestle with. Well, hold it still. One evening we were surprised to see Tadus build a fire in a little cooker that he has built outside. And of course we had our supper there, most of which was produce that had come from the little greenhouse. There was also some fresh fruit that was in season at that time. It was so nice to be able to sit outside with the family and enjoy the cool, crisp, clean air and to be able just to relax with our friends. The puppies were released to exercise and play three or four times a day. Their mother, Kama, would join us, but she kept moving to discourage the pups from nursing. One exception for Kama's behavior was for her to stand still for her time with Betta. This video shows the strong bond and love that Betta and Kama share. Dunai is the father of this litter of puppies and as a maturing male he's becoming very protective even more so than the females would be. He really didn't quite know how to handle the puppies and because of their attention he was kind of edgy. Betta was afraid that maybe he would really take a dislike to me so she didn't trust us to be together. After I talked her into introducing Dunai and me we became very good friends, enough so that he would even come to me in hopes that I could uh, help him escape the attentions of the puppies. It got to be that when I would walk out the front door, he would come running with his tail wagging for attention, while Kama would just still stay asleep and resting. The puppies were in their outside pen part of every day. They kept themselves occupied as they enjoyed the summer air and sunshine. The kennel pen in the barn was regularly cleaned and bedding changed. The puppies enjoyed playing in this new straw.
Unfortunately for me, Betta shares my attraction to chocolate. One day she decided that cherries, which happens to be my favorite fruit, would be a nice addition to a rich chocolate cake. Yum. We were with the puppies three or four times a day as they explored the world, played, and just were being puppies. They are all healthy, active, strong pups. It was a joy to watch them. Even though our friends have only one little old Aracana hen, their flock does include some Americanas, and consequently they receive eggs in a variety of colors. Their eggs are delicious, and Betta is able to sell some of them to friends, and that provides her with a little bit of egg money. Mava, their Border Terrier Dog keeps her eyes on everyone and everything that's going on in this busy household. A big job. Tadus is a very gifted and talented artist and woodcarver. He made and surprised us with this beautiful Aracana wall plaque. Hanya their youngest daughter has shown signs of following in his artistic footsteps, even at a very young age. The Matvievich family's veterinarian has several Persian cats in her office. One of them had kittens, and she made Hanya the gift of a Persian kitten. The kitten's name is Kate. She manages to be dressed in a bow on occasion when Hanya feels that's necessary. Otherwise, she's a very active kitten and uh, a little bit of a comedian on, at times.
We were able to snap these pictures of the pups during some of their calm moments. Then it was puppy feeding time. On the last day of our visit in Poland, one of the puppies was headed to Texas. In order to do that, Betta had to drive all night to deliver the puppy to the airport in Warsaw very early in the morning. That left us in charge of the kennel, meaning that we were to feed and exercise the puppies during the day. By the time Betta returned late in the afternoon, she was totally worn out and this picture shows how Nava helped her get rest to regain her strength. We traveled through the night on the bus to get from Poland to Berlin, Germany. The next morning we looked out the seventh floor hotel window to watch the activity at the bus station and took this video. On this visit to Berlin, we found that we were becoming a lot more familiar with the subway system, and these standards that list all the stops on a line were tools that we used to good advantage. Walking in the streets of this beautiful city is a challenge, as there are always new, different, and interesting things for one to look at and investigate. In downtown Berlin, a new section of subway is being built, and on the temporary walls along the construction area, many things are depicted. One's a very old home that we visited. It was built by a wealthy family in Berlin between the years of 1759 and 1761. It's now been restored and has become a museum, and uh, it's interesting to see the furnishings from that time period. During one of our walks through the Berlin cities, we passed a shop with a sign stating that they had German embroidery lace, and it drew us right in the shop. We came away with a couple pieces of this needlecraft. 
One of the most compelling structures in Berlin is the television tower. It was built during the late 1960s by the East German government and was to have been a real landmark, a symbol of the strength of the communists. It's built near the Alexanderplatz, which seems to be the crossroads of the world. The tower is about 1,200 feet high. We went to the observation area that's more than 600 feet above the ground, and the elevator ride to there took us only 40 seconds. The view from the deck is said to be as much as 50 miles. Our friend Dagmar was with us. She pointed out a number of interesting sites, including the unique arts school where she teaches. We paid a visit to the Baudet Museum that has a collection of sculpture from all over Europe, dating from the 1600s to the mid-1900s. There is so much interesting artwork to see that I hope to return for another visit in the future. We made a stop at the Berlin Technical Museum. It's a very interesting museum. It's nicely organized, but it's smaller than the Ford Museum with which we're familiar. It had a roundhouse full of trains, interesting small automobile display, but the bus and truck exhibit was closed. That's what I plan to see when Joyce goes back to the art museum. Outside was an old windmill but Joyce is fascinated by the large electric producing windmills that are so popular in Germany. Here we found the blade to one of them, and Joyce is standing beside it to show its size. We rode the high-speed ICE train the 360 miles through Germany for a smooth ride from Berlin to Munich. It was good to be with our friends Ludwig and Christa Liebel. They treated us to a traditional Bavarian dinner. It was delicious. On our first morning in Munich, our friend Ludwig met us at the hotel and then took us for a subway ride. Christa had organized a well-laid-out walking tour of Munich for us, and it began with a beautiful garden. This fence surrounded the garden and reminded me of the written music treble clef. We spent most of the day walking through the streets of Munich. The city is 855 years old. Everywhere one turned, there was something to study. People, building, statues, just all kinds of things. The old and the new blend together in this interesting city. We've become accustomed to seeing a variety of live statues in Europe. In front of the famous Hofbrauhaus Beer Hall in Munich, we saw one that I consider the best and most talented in our experience. Not allowed this, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh, no. 
1589, a brewery was formed to supply the court with beer. Since 1830, that beer has been served to the public at this location in this popular Bavarian Beer Hall. After our visit to the Hofbra House, Joyce risked causing an international incident and did a little routine with the statue. He was so good that we sent this movie to YouTube. We soon learned that there was another YouTube of him, but in that one he was using a different costume.
Downtown Munich has a succulent open-air market, and we grazed through there after we were finished with the Hofbrau House and the live statue. I succumbed to some smoked bolognas, cheese, and some fresh sweet cherries. Yum. We also bought some fruit-flavored tea that we're still using and some samples of local honeys. Highly decorated maypoles are an important tradition in Bavaria. This was the first one we had seen, and it was at the edge of the open-air market in Munich. Ludwig directed us to a cafe for a delicious treat. The center of the city of Munich is famous for its variety of Catholic churches and cathedrals. Most of them are very old and, to our eyes, very ornate. We visited enough of these buildings that we came away not able to distinguish one from the other. Krista was unable to be with us on our day walking in Munich, but she did all the planning, so we called her our tour director. Ludwig spent the day walking with us, so we called him our tour guide. We appreciate their giving us a grand tour of Munich. After we nearly walked our legs off in downtown Munich, we drove toward the Liebels' home in nearby Unterschlesheim. On the way, we stopped at the town's Maypole, and on it, Ludwig identified the shield of an organization to which he and Krista belonged. We went to the Liebels' home to visit with them and their grandson, Florian. The sunroom of their house was delightful and very pleasant, but became even more so when we were served tea, coffee, juice, and apple strudel that Krista had baked for us. It was so good. In the evening, Krista served us a delicious meal, and Florian made sure that we heard the German words for all the food. Then he wanted to know the English words. One morning, we took a walk on the street near our hotel. At that time, Germany was having both state and federal election campaigns. We were told that Bavaria is the richest of the German states, and that the Bavarian people resent the fact that so much of their tax money is distributed to other parts of the country. This campaign sign that we saw struck us as being very similar to the situation in America. While we were walking, we saw a 1949 London double-decker bus parked in an alley. Even though this is not one of our pictures, we also spotted some BMWs with unique paint schemes. This was quite a puzzle to us until we learned that these are experimental cars that are being road tested, and it was then easy to spot them in traffic. 
in the BMW Museum, I found a vehicle that I'm sure needs to be fueled by Bavarian apple strudel. Ludwig found just the car for Fritz and Joyce, so we posed for these pictures. The research vehicles on display at the museum are made of carbon fiber. This seems to be the direction that automotive technology is taking. There was a sedan, a cutaway version of the sedan, and also a roadster. The BMW family has expanded to include the British Mini, as we have seen. Rolls-Royce is also a member of the family, and there was an interesting Rolls Coupe on display. The 12-cylinder Rolls-Royce engine almost has the appearance of a work of art. As a retired BMW employee, our friend Ludwig has preferential access to BMW leased vehicles. He drives an interesting small car, which we later found is powered by a 1600cc diesel engine. On several occasions, the engine would stop as we waited at red traffic lights. I was puzzled. The engine restarted instantly when he pushed on the gas pedal, though. Although this is an interesting fuel-saving scheme, my imagination determined that it would be much more appropriately applied to the large displacement engines used in American cars of the 1960s. There was a larger convertible belonging to the same BMW family as Ludwig's car in the museum. This also had a diesel engine. I decided that I would be happy to find a place if it wanted to follow me home. However, it's still in the museum. In 1972, Munich hosted the Olympic Games. A number of the buildings are still in use, and the grounds have been well maintained for people to visit and enjoy. There's a lake at the Olympic Park, and it provided a good opportunity for us to sit on a bench and relax. An interesting attraction there is the plastic balls that people, <laughs> mostly children, are zipped into so that they can float on the water. There were some ducks on the lake, too, but because we had nothing for them to eat, they gave us very little attention.
We especially enjoyed watching this pretty little girl while she enjoyed her ride on the lake. Then we went to a nice restaurant where Krista had a meal of duck. On this last evening of our vacation, we went to this restaurant for more delicious Bavarian food. It was served by a very nice waitress dressed in the local costume. On this day when we had gone to the BMW Museum, Ludwig proudly wore his BMW work clothes. On several occasions, we had seen these covered BMW motorcycles. Ludwig always expressed contempt for them as being a very dangerous and poor design, since in spite of having protection above the rider, they are also top-heavy and prone to tip over. Near our hotel, there was a manufacturer of Ferris wheels. We were told that they would construct each one before shipment, and the Ferris wheel did light up the night sky. This last evening of our vacation, we walked several blocks in the industrial area to get a closer look to the Ferris wheel, and to take a few pictures. I was stopped by a guard and was politely spoken to in German. He quickly realized he had a tourist on his hands that didn't know much German. With gestures, he let me know that he must stop me, but not my camera. He even pointed out a better place and angle for a picture. He put on his guard face while he watched me. A very slight smile came when I thanked him in broken German. He even gave me a small, stiff wave as I walked back towards the hotel. I guess I gave him a crazy tourist tale to tell when he goes home after his work shift. This crazy tourist and Fritz headed home the next morning with many found memories from our time in August 2013 in Europe.